good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship. And I want to extend a warm and loving greeting to all the mothers and grandmothers, aunts, and any women who nurture and support children. So happy Mother's Day to all of you. And today we are grateful to continue the sermon series called A Hidden Wholeness, uh, based on this book. Uh, by the same title, A Hidden Wholeness by Parker Palmer. And the invitation of this is to look at how life is often divided for us. Our inner life is usually separated from our outer life. Our inner sense of who we are is often separated from others and, and even sometimes hidden from us. And the invitation is to go deep into our souls, to rediscover that sense of wholeness that God has implanted in each one of us. And today we are focusing on community and the importance of community. And so the invitation is to look at how soulful communities bring us back to that sense of wholeness. Uh, it's interesting because that's, community is where we often get wounded, but also community is the place where we find our healing. And I had, I had prepared something, a different story to share with you uh, about from the book from Parker Palmer. But then uh, yesterday as I was reading this book called Rethinking Life by Shane uh, Claiborne, uh, a story came to my mind that I thought, you know, would be really good at illustrating this point about the importance of uh, community. And so in this story, uh, he tells about uh, Rabbi Kushner, Harold Kushner, who for many years befriended this uh, Episcopal priest. And so th they, would, they agreed to go out and have a once a month lunch and share about life and faith. It was interesting because at the beginning, you know, they had to have some formal conversations. And uh, one of those conversations was about Jesus. So each person was supposed to share about what uh, they thought about Jesus and bring it to discuss at their lunch. And so they wrote down what they thought. And so here's, I'm, I'm going to share with you what uh, Rabbi Kushner uh, wrote about Jesus in response to his understanding of Jesus. So he said, I'm wary of Jesus, not because of anything he taught or even because of anything his disciples ta taught about him. I'm wary of Jesus because of history and what so many of those who said they believed in him have done to my people. Christianity, you can say, has ruined Jesus for me. Somehow, through the ages, the suffering Jesus has become confused with the suffering of the Jewish people, my people. That is the key to my problem with him. His death has even become casually lined with some denial on my part. And this in turn has been used as a justification for my suffering. In this way, Jesus means for me, not the, the one who suffered for the world's sins, but the one, who on account, on, the one on account of whom I must suffer. So he's, he read this to his friend at the lunch, and you can imagine the reaction of the Episcopal priest. So he looked up as after reading this, and he saw the, the face of his friend look like ash, just look like the light went out of his face. And so he thought, uh-oh, I said something really offensive. This is a new friendship, and I really went too far. But then, he said, the priest responded with a tearful whisper. Please forgive me. Forgive us. It couldn't have been Jesus those Christians served. And so Rabbi Kushner said, he, the conversation continued, and he said to him, your religion wants you to care about me that much? So thinking, you know, it was a surprise to him. And so the priest responded by saying, oh, yes, don't you see, I must continually seek to find God in every person. Jesus is only the beginning. You, Larry, are easy, but the ultimate goal is to find my Lord within everyone, even people I like a lot less than you, even people I dislike, even ones I despise. 
And then it dawned on me, this is Kushner saying this, reflecting on it, and it, then it dawned on me. So that's what it means to say that God can take the form of a human being. And it was a moment of transformation for their friendship, for Rabbi Kushner's understanding of what uh, the story of the incarnation is all about. And so I thought it's, it's a great story that tells us how important it is for us to have relationships, honest, open relationships where we can share our souls when we hold the space for each other to grow, to reflect on who we are as children of God. And so I want to invite us to take a deep breath today and open our hearts to worship. As we gather on this day, I pray that the Holy Spirit will open us up to the wisdom that is beyond our comprehension, but is deep within our souls. So I invite you to join me in the call to worship. Friends, we gather this day to celebrate life. The life we share with one another in community. Let us be grateful for the joy of life. Please join me in singing hymn number uh, 469, Morning Has Broken. And the invitation is for us to stand together as we are able. Please be seated. I invite you at this time to share any joys or concerns that you may have. If you'd like to share something, uh, happy to bring a microphone to you. Uh, 
I'm going to share a joy. Actually, uh, Bill Cox had a heart valve repair surgery procedure this past week, and he's doing well, so we give thanks to God for that. I just want to be grateful to God that my parents are here. Yay! Paul and, and here Bev to Kern. celebrate Mother's Day with my mother. All right. All right. We're here. Are you saying something for us, Paul? I'm very glad to be here. I thank for all the prayers, and God answered me with a little stroke so we could celebrate our 60th anniversary at the Veterans Home. And I'm, oh, I'm not going to say it. I'm making bags. Um, um, what is it? What was that last part? He'll make it back. He'll make it back. It's not the only time. That's I'm right. glad. <laughs> We're glad. Pam, do you want to, or Mike, do you want to say anything about Pam today? <laughs> Alice? It's my daughter's birthday. Yes. Perfect. What a gift. Happy birthday. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, Pam, do you want to tell us about today? And then I thought, oh, that's not fair to do that to her. So we're grateful for your life. All right. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Thankful for having my family here with me today. And seeing, and Kathy's. seeing all the other families in church today yes. and having mine here also. All right. We're very grateful for all the families gathering and honoring mothers and grandmothers today. We also have our friends from Ohio. I call them the friends from Ohio. And you know what's funny is that every time I see them, I think Muscoff, and I know better. I always, you know, their last name is Hyde. Um, and Sandy and Kevin Hyde, but because she is a Muscoff, it's stuck in my head as Muscoff, so I have to behave myself. But we're grateful that they're here and grateful that they're also connecting our two churches between their church in Ohio and our church here, uh, Westminster Presbyterian Church in Dayton. They're having their youth come here for their um, annual trip, I guess, for their choir. They, they were Westminster, what is it called? It's not Westminster. It's the Knox Choir. And so it's their choir that will come here June 14th. There will be a community dinner and we're very excited about it that there will be this opportunity for us. And so they're involved in making sure we have food and uh, we're very grateful for the gift of that as well. So let us continue in prayer. God of all power and love, we give thanks for your unfailing presence and the hope you provide Revive us to live as Christ's body in the world. A people who pray, worship, learn, pray bread, share life, heal neighbors, bear the news, see justice, rest, and grow in the spirit. Wherever and however we gather, unite us in common prayer and send us in common mission. And we take a few moments of silence to bring our hearts before God in prayer. And we continue in prayer, using the Lord's Prayer and bringing our hearts together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
beautiful. <laughs> that was very different indeed. Thank you. But I liked it. I that was I love the rhythm with it. And so today we are focusing on this theme of being alone while being together. So being alone doesn't mean being on our own, but really the invitation is to look at the power of community to help us to discover our own souls. And what came to my mind in thinking about this theme is uh, the work of Becca Stevens. You probably, um, I'm assuming uh, my friend Nancy in Ohio has talked to you a lot about thistle farms. She's the one that introduced me to her uh, work and, and the book that is called Love Heals. Uh, Becca Stevens has had this ministry in Nashville, Tennessee with women who are dealing with addiction or exploitation or sex trafficking and trying to get off the streets, trying to find their own wholeness. And so this ministry is about creating community and opportunities for these women. And they have uh, coffee shops, they have products that are made by the women, and they have ministries uh, all over the world now trying to address the needs of these women who are usually without the support of a, a loving community. And so the song, there is a book uh, by Becca Stevens called uh, Love Heals, but also her son wrote a song called Love Heals. And it is based on her work and her experience of healing others. So we will watch the, the song, we'll listen to it, but it will have also some of the people, the women that they've worked with and they brought that sense of wholeness. Birds fly, rocks roll, tears cry, and love, love heals. Whiskey burns, records scratch, wheels turn. Sparks catch in love Love heals Oh, I've never seen a broken heart One shattered and torn apart That could not come back together And I've never known a life so heavy Couldn't stand on legs unsteady one day run by as a feather Baby, here's a deal Love heals Sun sets Sun sets Sun's rise Sun's rise On regrets and Bars. Dreamers dream Some dreams come true We're caught between A hell that's coffee black And heaven that's sky blue Oh, I've never seen a broken heart One shattered and torn apart That could not come back together Oh, I never know a life so heavy Couldn't stand on legs unsteady And one day run by as a feather Baby, here's a deal Love heals And everything that's shiny one day gets broke It's some kind of mystery But this much I know Love Love heals And the power
power of this is that the women are not told what to do when they join the community. What they're surrounded with is a lot of love. They're accepted, they're brought together into this community that takes care of their needs and helps them to see that they are worth it, even just as they are, as they are broken as they may feel. They bring them back to that sense of wholeness. And so I think it's a beautiful image for us to think about this power of community when it's intentional about its unconditional love. Because when you think about how we normally react, if somebody messes up, what do we do normally? We punish them. Society says you've got to punish them. Or we have to put them into a reform program and then they have to follow all the rules and when they break them, they go back to prison or we shun them. This is a different model. This is more of a Christ model where grace is given even as the person is struggling, even as, as the person is uh, dealing with addiction. And then the other pieces fall into place after they feel that sense of deep love. And so today I want to invite us to think about this for us. Now, those of us who are not on the streets, there were, we have not been sex trafficked, we don't have maybe the big issues, but we struggle with being feeling whole, with feeling that sense of joy about life, with feeling like, you know, my life, even though, you know, maybe the circumstances are not going great, because we all have those times in our lives when you know, okay, you're going, your life is going really well, and then something happens. Whether you lose a loved one, or you have an illness, or you struggle with your own uh, relationships, there are lots of ways life is not what we would imagine it to be. What do we do in those times? How do we find our wholeness? How do we hold on to that sense of joy that we are here for a purpose? We are here to live that sense of joy. And that's the power of community that holds us together, that reminds us that we belong, that our souls are still intact, even in the worst of time. And community spaces, oftentimes in our experience, they usually invite other things. They invite the intellect, they invite the, the ego, they invite uh, willpower, but rarely are they created to invite the soul. Now think about your own circles. Where do you feel safe enough to really be who you are, to really bring all of your self to the table? And so Parker Palmer talks about this paradox of being with others while also being our own selves. He quotes Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German um, theologian during the time of Nazi Germany, who talked a lot about life together and the importance of community, true community, he talks about it, not community that, oh, well, you know, the, a lot of the Christians, he was really against a lot of the, the church that said, well, this is the way it is, that there are people who are better than others, and they went with what uh, Hitler was doing. But this guy, he had the call of Christ on his life, and he felt very strongly to oppose that way, and he formed a, com a community around him that also stood up to, to the Nazi ideology. Of course, the price was high for him. He ended up being executed for, for doing such a thing. But this is what he had to say. That the person who cannot be alone beware of community. And so these are the people that are always needing others. They can't be alone. Um, you know, we've all been there where you just need a distraction all the time because you're, suffer you're not dealing with your own suffering. And let the person who's not in community beware of being alone. So again, that whole idea that we need both. So Parker Palmer says, we have much to learn from within, but it is too easy to get lost in the labyrinth of our inner life. We have uh, much to learn from others, but it is easy to get lost in the confusion of the crowd. So he talks about those spaces, those communities that bring us together, neither uh, judging us uh, f to be deficient nor trying to force us to change, but accepting us exactly as we are. So it's a really interesting piece when you look at your own life. 
Who are the people who accept you for who you are? Can you feel safe with them? Do you feel safe? And what are the, the pieces that are there? And today, our Bible story, I've always looked at this transfiguration story as a story of something that just happened to Jesus. But today, I want to invite us to consider what was happening with his disciples. So this is the story when they went up to a mountain and Jesus had a, an experience of the Holy Spirit and his physical appearance changed. So let's listen to Matthew 17. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up to a high, to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, for one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved, with, whom, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So think of, the, of this story. Even though the disciples could not intellectually understand what was happening, they learned how to hold the space for Jesus to have this experience, and they became part of it. And it's interesting that Jesus could have gone up to the mountain by himself, but he decided to take these three. He was teaching them about how to hold the space. And so we'll, I'm going to share with you three pieces that I feel are relevant to our own experience for today with the theme we have of the hidden wholeness. The space. The space was significant. A mountain. This was something that they would have been uh, easily identified with. People always believed that going up to a mountain and praying was somehow better. And uh, they've, they've also had experiences like Moses, uh, where he had an encounter with God on a mountain, where he received the Ten Commandments on a mountain, where Jesus preached his most important sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. According to Matthew, it was very important, the location, the space that was created was intentional. And I think that's, that's very helpful to us when we think of how we set up the space. How, not just, you know, physically, but emotionally. What are the spaces that we occupy? Do we occupy it with a lot of words or do we occupy the space with a lot of presence and love? Um, so thinking of the space as part of this allowing people to feel safe is very important. Then the ministry of presence. Now they didn't understand what was happening. I love that Peter says, Lord, should we make you some dwelling places? I don't know what that was about. I was kind of like, what? What did he want to do? I, he was just saying something to say something. You can, you can tell that it was like, oh, Moses, Elijah, how exciting. Can you imagine? These were the big time uh, people in their, in their religion. I mean, it's kind of like, who's your favorite rock star? Come on. Kid Rock? Okay. What did, is that you that said that? No? <laughs> who else did you say? P Peter who? Frampton. I have no idea who that is. I'm, I'm terrible. <laughs> Guitar player. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, think about it. Maybe, maybe a musician. Maybe a, su uh, a, a film star or whatever. Think about it. You know, somebody that you'll look up to. Um, actually, I was attending a, a meeting yesterday for uh, a group of 
pastors or commissioned pastors and the son of one of the pastors is traveling with a pre we they ask for prayers but because he works for the associated press he, he runs this the press for the white house it doesn't matter who the president is but he's traveling today with a president and i was like oh i gotta look this kid up uh, i'm sure he's not a kid he's probably Old, older than myself. But anyway, they were talking about him, and, and I thought, wow, isn't it interesting to be in the room with all the important people? So this, it just came to my mind to think about these poor disciples. All of a sudden, they're seeing Moses and Elijah. They're the ones that they looked up to in their religion. And they were the, what is it, Peter Froman? Frampton, sorry. <laughs> Kid Rock, I like that. Easier, <laughs> easier for my brain to remember. Did it, did, does everybody know this this guy? Yeah. Yes, except for me. Okay. <laughs> I should not confess. I would be like, yeah, oh yes, I know who that is. But think about it. Um, in terms of these big names, Moses and Elijah are up there. And they don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. It's a big time experience for them. These are fishermen from Galilee. You know, they're not, they're not really important people. They're sitting there and they get to see these amazing visions of these amazing leaders. And they're wondering what to do. But what was important is that they stayed there with Jesus. And I love them, even when they experienced hearing the voice of God, they were terrified. They, knee, they knelt down on the ground and are, they didn't even look up until the whole thing was over. When they looked up, everything was over and Jesus had to comfort them. So it's a really interesting piece of thinking of the ministry of presence. We talk about this often when, uh, when the time of death is near for people. You know, people say, well, what do I say to the person? What, how do I act if they're really upset or hurt or struggling? It's like, you know, you will know. You just need to be there. You don't need to say the right things. You don't need to know what to say. It's what's important is your heart being there for the person. And that's true of not just the time of death. It's just being present, focusing on that ministry of presence. Then there was the peace of Jesus saying to them, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone about this vision. Now imagine, you just saw Peter... <laughs> I gotta look this up. Anyway, the guy, the guitarist, you saw him and you're excited about this experience and you're not supposed to say anything. What was that about? Why did Jesus not want them to go tell everybody? They saw Moses and Elijah and they wanted to tell everyone and they didn't because they were supposed to hold it for him confidentiality. Think about that piece. I know we don't think about it in this way for Jesus, that it was important that Jesus would uh, unfold the knowledge for the people at the right time about who he was and what his ministry was. People were not ready to hear about Moses and Elijah showing up for Jesus and being on equal footing with him. People would have either judged Jesus or made fun of the disciples, or worse, they would have totally dismissed him. And so Jesus needed that group to experience all of this because they were the ones that were going to form community. I mean, think of Peter. Peter was a very important figure in the, in the Christian church. He was the one upon whom Jesus built his church. So he was the one that was going to set the tone of what the gatherings of the community were. And, it, and remember that time. Now, we gather in worship here. There's no fear of uh, people coming and, and saying, no, it's against the law to gather and worship. But at that time, the Christians were being persecuted. Think about for a long time, for the first two and three centuries of the movement, they were seen as a threat to the whole empire. Think of this confidentiality, of how important it was for the people to come and worship and know they weren't going to be told uh, on their, their friends, their uh, gathered community is not going to go tell the authorities where they gathered and how, who was there and what their jobs were. 
because it would, it would have meant death for the people. So again, holding that space a uh, confidentiality was literally important. But think about it in our own lives, where you gather with people and you want to share something deep, but you don't want to go, you know, meeting them at the grocery store the next day, and then they ask you, you know, how is it with da 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 da? Think of a uh, AA, uh, the community they create, and the sense of confidentiality. How important it is for recovery, where people, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, that's one of their trademarks, is that the, you only know the f the first name of the person, and you. If you see them on the street or any other function, you do not bring this up. You don't say, well, last week when I saw you at AA, you don't do that. Because why, why is that important? Think about it. When you share something deep, you don't want, you're not ready for just the general public to know about it. You are, you are with those people that really care and they can know how to hold the space and other people may not be as kind and gracious. And so Jesus was teaching his disciples to live and practice their faith so that their community circles would become the breeding ground for people who know how to help each other access their souls. It's a really key piece here, being alone and being together. So holding this uh, concept. Now Parker Palmer talks about this idea of circles of trust. We're going to deal with that in a couple of weeks. And I want to invite you to come to a practice of, of a circle of trust. There will be two gatherings. You could come to one, and it's, it's not, it, you only would be committing to one. One will be on June 4th uh, in, at 6.30 in the evening. It's a Sunday uh, afternoon, evening, and then one will be June 7th at 6.30. Again, come and practice. We will have all the guidelines on how to practice being in a circle of trust where you really learn how to hold the space uh, for others. And so uh, I, as you walked in today, hopefully you got the guidelines for open and honest questions. This is one of the trademarks also of a circle of trust. Open and honest questions. The first time I heard that, I'm like, oh, there are dishonest questions and closed questions. But when you think about some of the questions we ask and how they carry judgment often in them or they don't let the person really know uh, how to listen to themselves. So, so in, in these questions, you have uh, the questions... You would ask something that you would not possibly know the answer to. So there's no way for you to understand or to know ahead of time of how the person would, would answer. And then uh, also not getting ahead of the person that's speaking. So really staying with what they're saying to you. Then there is the asking questions that are brief and to the point. Instead of adding uh, stuff from your own, your own experience, oh yeah, let me tell you, you know, last week when I went to the, then you took the attention from what the person is saying. Then ask questions that go to the person as well as the problem. And so thinking about uh, questions that really d lead inward. Ask questions aimed at helping the presenter explore his or her concern rather than satisfying your own curiosity. If you had that experience or you say to someone, well, so-and-so is, uh, you know, or I'm really struggling. I'll tell you, I'll give you my own personal example. I'm, I'm really struggling. My brother is, this week, he's getting to the phase of not being, being non-responsive most of the time. So if someone is trying to hold the space for me, and I'm not saying, I'm not putting anybody on the spot here, but if somebody's trying to hold this soul space for me, the question would be not about, oh, well, how long has this been going on? Tell me who, what kind of care does he have? What kind of cancer does he have? None of that. It's really asking, so how are you feeling about this? What's going on? Is there anything I can do to help? Maybe uh, asking, how, how is he dealing with it? How is the family? So you could be asking those questions, not asking for curiosity to get information about the situation, but you're really helping me move inward. 
Um, if you have an intuition that a certain question might be useful, even if it seems a bit off the wall, uh, trust it. And so this is uh, an example is what color is this issue for you and why? Interesting to think about it this way. What color? Oh, it's red. Or, you know, I'm really upset. I feel, you know, I'm seeing red. Have you, you hear that, you know, answer would become a very good point to go inward. If you aren't sure about a particular question, sit with it and let it go um, for a while until you have some clarity. Another thing, if you're in a circle, or a group of people, and you're hammering the person with questions. You gotta watch the pace. So also, because we, part of that is that we struggle with silence. Have you been in a group where there is, you know, you ask a question and there's no answer? What do you do? You fill it with more talk. And so to be in that uncomfortable place of just letting the, the person experience that. Avoid questions with yes and no or right or wrong answers. So this way you're not looking for just informational stuff. So I would invite you to consider this because it could be applied in your daily life when you have people in your life that you want to hold that space for. And try to play with it and practice it where you open the space, you hold the space for others. Uh, and not always in that, you know, ego place or the mind, the mind always wants to analyze. The mind wants to build some dwelling places for Moses and Elijah. But the spirit is about being there and listening and holding the space and really allowing God to speak to you. So I'm just going to pause here for a second and I thought, if you have any thoughts, reactions, questions, it's a good time to share. Nothing. <laughs> I'm going to hold this space, okay, until someone speaks. <laughs> I want to invite you to consider what does it look like for you? Does this, does this ring true for your experience of people who think about the people who have held the space for you, where your soul was present and how that is? What did they do? What was the quality? Or when you might have had those experiences, we're like, wow, I was able to hold the space today for so and so that needed that space to, to go deep. So consider that and consider the power of, of what that is for you. And we're gonna end with a poem that's on your sheet uh, by, John, uh, by John Fox. It's called, When Someone Deeply Listens to You. When someone deeply listens to you, it is like holding out a dented cup you've had since childhood and watching it fill up with cold, fresh water. When it balances on top of the brim, you are understood. When it overflows and touches your skin, you are loved. When someone deeply listens to you, the room where you stay starts a new life and the place where you wrote your first poem begins to glow in your mind's eye. It's as if gold has been discovered. When someone deeply listens to you, your bare feet are on the earth, and a beloved land that seemed distant is now at home within you. Amen. And please stand as you are able and join me in singing hymn number 434. Today we are all called to be.
And for the blessing, these words from Jan Richardson, and the table will be wide. And I was thinking about today is the one year anniversary of the shooting massacre in Buffalo. So thinking of the words and the power of God and the grace that is needed in our world, I hope you will listen to these words and be encouraged to think of how God is calling you to bring healing and love to a very wounded, broken world. And the table will be wide and the welcome will be wide. And the arms will be open wide to gather us in and our hearts will open wide to receive and we will come as children who trust there is enough, and we will come unhindered and free, and our aching will be met with bread, and our sorrow will be met with wine, and we will open our hands to the feast without shame, and we will turn toward each other without fear, and we will give up our appetite for despair, and we will taste and know of delight, and we will become bread for a hungering world, and we will become drink for those who thirst. And the blessed will become the blessing, and everywhere will be the feast. Go proclaiming and living these words of God's grace. And the peace of Christ will be with you. Please turn to your neighbors and share the peace of Christ. He comes up and he's got a big hand. 